Howdy and welcome to the 10 Week Bible Study. This is week seven, day two of our study of First and Second Timothy. I'm your host, Aaron Hibbs, and today we're talking about 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 8. Welcome back to the 10-Week Bible Study. Again, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs. Before we get started, I want to encourage you to join our Facebook group. You can find a quick link to it at 10weekbible.com. And in the group, you can meet other people following along with the 10-Week Bible Study, and this podcast can actually become a dialogue. All right, with that, let's go ahead and pray before we start today. Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear what your word has to say to us. God, speak to us. Fill our hearts with the knowledge of you today. We want to encounter you through your word In Jesus' name we pray, amen. With that, let's jump into God's word. I'll be reading today from the NIV. This is 2 Timothy 1, starting in verse 6. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I want to pause right there. This is one of the most powerful verses in all of the letters of Paul. This, this idea that, that we need to stir up a spiritual gift. And I, I believe, you know, he's speaking directly to Timothy about something specific, right? He's, he's saying, stir up this gift that God has given you. Most people assume that he's talking about preaching or teaching, but he's not specific here. We don't actually know. That's, that's a, a valid assumption since that's the, the thing that Paul kind of encourages Timothy in the most throughout First and Second Timothy, very valid assumption, but it might be something else. Paul might be referencing something, uh, some other spiritual gift that God has has given to Timothy through that laying on of hands. So he's saying, stir that up and you practice it, in other words. And that's a that's a, a difficult thing for a lot of people is to think about practicing a spiritual gift. If it's spiritual and it's from God, how can we practice? But that's just the nature of, of humanity in every way. It's a gift any spiritual gift, whether it's it's preaching, uh, you know, teaching, prophesying, those are all things that can be practiced, and you can grow in those things. If God has given you a prophetic gifting, it's something that you need to grow in. And now, it, a lot of people have difficulty with something like that. Well, if it's prophecy, isn't that God speaking to you? And there's all of these weird things that comes along with it. And, and it's not like we can grow in making God speak to us in, in any way, shape, or form. But what we can grow in is perceiving his voice and understanding this, the subtleties and the still, quiet nature of that. And then understanding how to actually relay that in a way that's not manipulative and, and, and weird and, and bad in all sorts of ways. So there's always ways that we can grow in that. We can grow in our, our sensitivity to God. The, the more we give ourselves over to uh, stirring that gift up, practicing that gift, that whatever spiritual gift the Lord has given us, whatever we've asked for, as we stir that up, we grow in our sensitivity to it. And we can grow in our sensitivity to teaching by actually fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit and, and having him teach us. And that doesn't mean that we don't do our, our diligence in in studying and in, in reading the scriptures and all of those kind of things if we're a teacher, but the Holy Spirit is the best teacher. And so that th- this is a, a truth for every single person. And what I love is this verse seven is such a powerful verse. So many people have, have, have used this as their life first, quoted this very often is that God has not given us a spirit of fear. Whenever we feel fear rising up in us, now, now, this is a, a, a challenging thing at the same time because Solomon says that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. And, and many people have tried to say, well, you know, because of verses like this, that Solomon's not saying, well, you know, to, to actually be afraid of God. He's meaning, you know, a, a, a solemn reverence. And there's no indication anywhere in scripture that that's what the word fear should mean. Fear is always being afraid of something, being terrified of something. And the implication that Paul, or that, excuse me, Solomon is making in the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs, is that the, be, the beginning of wisdom, right? We enter into this relationship. Wisdom begins when we understand that God is the one who 
holds our eternal fate, our eternal destiny in his hands. And that is a terrifying thing to think about, especially if you don't know his nature, if you don't know who he is and how he treats us. Like that's terrifying. And that's a thing that every single person has got to come to terms with is, oh my gosh, if there's an eternity and there's an eternal hell and an eternal heaven and all of this kind of stuff, and there's one guy, this this God who decides where I go, oh my gosh, that's really scary. How on earth do I get on his good side? Right? That's what Saul, Solomon is saying. Um, the beginning of wisdom. He's not saying that all wisdom lies in being afraid of God. No, no, no. He's saying it starts there. It starts there. We we enter into that. And so God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. It's not the thing that we live in, right? It's not the thing that indwells us. Fear is not the thing that indwells us. It's this short-lived entrance into the kingdom of God. When we understand the reality that we live in, is that God makes that decision and that's a pretty terrifying thing. But when we understand what he's done for us, right? That, that he's sent his son to die for us and, and take away our sins and then redeem us to him for all eternity. We will be raised, resurrected to new life for all eternity, right? There's no fear in that. Fear in, in, in proper understanding brings us to that where we discover who he actually is and his nature and his character and what he's done for us. And then we discover that we don't operate in a spirit of fear, but in power and love and sound mind that because he's done this for us, we have no need to fear anymore. It's where it begins, but it's not where it ends. It's not where we live. Verse eight, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Over and over throughout the New Testament, there is this call, and it's from every single biblical author, every single one kind of, they give us this call. And it's that when we understand our fate before what Jesus has done, when we understand the just the sheer weight of what we should have inherited an eternity of punishment and separation from God, and when we view in light of that, in light of what we deserve, what Jesus has done for us, and now what we're going to inherit, oh my goodness, nothing else makes sense but to devote every ounce of our strength to honoring God with our lives. That's the only thing that makes sense. To Paul saying, in light of all of this, in light of the fact that he hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and sound mind, it's like, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Speak it out. There is nothing that makes more sense than to be proud of what God has done for us. When we consider the chasm that we've crossed because of his great love, and Paul is saying to Timothy specifically, and don't be ashamed of me because I am a prisoner for his sake. And I think he would say to us, don't be ashamed of people that are suffering on account of God. Don't be ashamed of people who have put themselves out there and have lost homes and businesses and, and whatever else on account of the word of God, on account, on account of the gospel. We're not quite accustomed to that in the West, in the United States, just yet. And there are a few stories that we know of in our, our culture right now where people have, have experienced some persecution and things like this. They've lost homes and jobs on account of the Lord and on account of the gospel and their witness. But it's, it's few and far between right now. There are places on planet Earth right now where it's not few and far between. There are places on planet Earth right now where it's costly to share the gospel and it's costly to stand with those who are sharing the gospel and it's costly to stand with those who have been in prison for the sake of the gospel. It really is. And we see the writing on the wall here in the United States and in the West, it, we're heading that direction very, very quickly. Unless, unless the Lord intervenes, unless there is a, a dramatic turnaround in the course of our nation, which there may be, which there may be, we are praying for that. 
There are thousands, if not millions of people praying for there to be a revival and a dramatic turnaround in the course of the United States and all of the kind of the Christian West. If there isn't a course correction, we're headed down that same path as well. And so we will have to make decisions on whether or not we are ashamed to proclaim the gospel and ashamed to stand with those who do and ashamed to stand with those who suffer because of the gospel. Will we stand with them? Or will we be like so many people that Paul is going to to list in this book who abandon him in his hour of need? I don't think that there's anyone who can say that I most definitely would not be one of the people who abandon Paul in his hour of need. Uh, if, If all 12 apostles abandoned Jesus in his hour of need, I'm not going to proclaim that I'm good enough to not abandon him. What I want to do is ask the Lord, give me grace to be, to never be ashamed of the gospel. Give me grace to never be ashamed of those who stand for the gospel and stand for you, Lord. I want to turn it into a prayer. I don't want to turn it into a proclamation that I'm so sure that I would never, that I would never abandon those people or abandon the Lord. I want it to be a prayer. Again, if if the 12 apostles with, with Jesus himself in the flesh, if they all fell away, even momentarily, I'm not going to presume that I might not either. I want it to be a prayer. I've, I've encountered far too many people who would, would proclaim, I would never be ashamed of the gospel. I'd never turn away. And it's like, eh, I don't think you can so confidently predict that in every single imaginable situation. I bet there's some situations where you would think twice about it. And I know there are probably for me as well. And so let's turn it into our prayer. Lord, give me grace to never, ever be ashamed of the gospel or the power of God or those that stand for for both of those. The 10-Week Bible Study. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and I can't wait to see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the 10-Week Bible Study. If you've enjoyed this, would you consider doing that whole like and subscribe and bell thing you're always hearing people talk about? It really helps other people find out about the show, and my heart is for people to fall in love with God's Word. Thank you. Thank you.